Hey family, I'm Pastor Torre. Pastor Sarah. We just want to greet you before you get ready to watch this powerful message. We believe it's going to change your life. We've been praying for you. And we also want you to partner with us in changing the lives of others. As you know, we invested a lot into technology so that we can continue to bring the word to you in innovative and creative ways. But we don't just stop there. We also believe in blessing people in a more pragmatic way. That's right. You're about to watch this video that is going to tremendously bless you. But what you don't get to see is how we're blessing people off of the pulpit. There are families that are being fed. There are women who are being saved from human trafficking. There are so many organizations that we are able to support thanks to your generosity. So we want to invite you to be a part of changing the world with us. Yeah, we've been very intentional in this season to, to partner with organizations and support them financially that are making a difference considering a crisis. So we just thank you. They're giving instructions on the screen here. Partner with us and let's get into this word. I'm going to be speaking out of Colossians 3. I've got one scripture that I want to start with, but I have a few other scriptures that I'm going to be pulling from as I build out this thought, so be patient with me. So I'm going to be Colossians 3, simply verse 2. This isn't an unfamiliar text, but it's one that God has really been dealing with me about, and hopefully it's going to add some wisdom and depth to your journey and walk right now. Verse 2 begins, it says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Father God, you have given me clear instructions. For days now, you've been uttering this word to me. And so, Father, I just pray that you would allow this word to come forth exactly as you need it to come forth that you would use every part of me, Father, to deliver this word, and that you would leave nothing on the table. Father, open our hearts, open our minds, remove our excuses and distractions that we may feast from this word and become better as a result of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, I've been thinking, and the subject for this message, for those of you who like to take notes, is to make up your mind, make up your mind, which actually sounds a little bit easier than it actually is. Um, I think one of the greatest challenges that anyone in a relationship or friendship experiences is that question about, like, what do you want to eat? Like, why is that one of the greatest challenges in a relationship? Sure, there are all of these other finances and character and integrity, but one consistent, whether you're in a healthy relationship or in a toxic relationship, one of the recurring issues is being indecisive over what you want to eat. And I am guilty of having this problem. My husband always asks me, what do you want to eat? And I'm like, I don't care. But the thing is, I do care. I want to eat fat food. He wants to eat healthy food. And I don't want to be penalized for my choices, so I say nothing at all. And then I sit there and I eat the kale with the olive oil and the lemonade, lemon dressing, and I just suffer because I was too afraid to say what was actually on my mind, this notion of making up your mind. I think sometimes we don't like to deal with the consequences that come with making up our mind. As I was studying for this message, I kept hearing over and over again that we are in this season of being established. And when God is establishing us, there are some decisions that we have to make, but sometimes we're hesitant to make those decisions because we don't want to deal with the consequences. I know I should set my mind on this thing. I know I should set my mind on that thing. But what happens if my friendships fall off? What happens if I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to connect in those groups and categories and industries anymore? And so we don't set our minds at all all, not recognizing that even our indecisiveness is a mental state. Us being indecisive is setting our mind in James. It says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. It doesn't say that a double-minded man cannot build. It just means that whatever that double-minded man builds is unstable. 
So what if even in our indecisiveness, we think we aren't building, but we are actually building something. It's just something that isn't stable. And when God kept telling me that we were going to be talking about establishing in this season, what he was saying to me is that I'm bringing my people into a season where I want them to be stable. I want them to be solid. I want them to be established. And so we cannot be established unless we're willing to confront the areas in our life where we are unstable. I used to live in this planned community in Texas when I was a single mother and I just had this dream of home ownership and I saved and I pinched and my dream was to live in this like planned community of tracks homes where you know your kids could walk to the school bus and they were friends with the neighbors and I finally got this house. And I can remember that when I finally got the house that there was a lot across the street that was empty. And I used to think to myself, oh my goodness, it's going to be so hard living beside all of this construction and it's going to be so noisy. What I didn't realize though was how quickly they built those homes. They build them so fast that the noise isn't actually even that bad because they just spring up so rapidly. But there is this season where they don't just build every single day because they lay the foundation. And when you lay the foundation of a home, you don't lay the foundation and then build on it the next day. Because if you build on the foundation before it's ready, you run the risk of cracking the foundation. And if the foundation is cracked, then anything you build on that house runs the risk of being ruined. There are so many of us who look at the houses and the lives that we see that have been built and we think to ourselves, I want a house like that. But the reality is what we really need to be asking is I wonder if there's any cracks in those foundations. I wonder what had to happen in order for that house to stand as tall as it's standing. I look at some of my mentors in the faith and we're going through this pandemic and I call him my spiritual grandfather and I I checked on him because, you know, he's got a church and, and they're a little, compared to us, I guess you'd call it a little bit old school, but it's a Holy Ghost sanctified church and I texted him to ask him how things were going with the pandemic and having to do things virtual. And he says, honey, we're just adjusting because they have so much foundation that they don't let these things come and just shake them. And I just feel that prophetically for you. You're watching this video and you've been shaken and there's nothing wrong with being shaken. But there comes a moment when God says, I'm showing you where you're being shaken, not so that I can scare you and not so that you are, a, not so that you will no longer be but rather so that you can understand where the cracks are so that when you build the next time I feel that for somebody I don't know who you are you got a little bit shaken up and you realize that there was a crack in your foundation and instead of fixing the crack in your foundation you decided instead that I won't build on it at all and I hear God saying that he revealed the crack in your foundation so that you would come to a place where you realize that that crack was exposed so that it could be fixed addressed and I could build again I feel that for somebody it's building season I feel the spirit of God on that like something I've never felt before that God is establishing new leadership he's establishing new trailblazers he's establishing new ways of being in your family new ways of being in your community and you think the fact that you have a crack in your foundation has disqualified you and I hear God saying the only way I can build you up to the next dimension is if I expose to you where the cracks in your foundation are you see God God isn't like these master builders who starts off with a blank canvas. When God gets ready to build you up, he has to take inventory of what you brought to him. When you come to God, you already have paradigms built. When you come to God, you already have ideologies. When you come to God, you already have a perspective on who you are. And I hear God saying that when you came to me, there were some cracks in your foundation. And in order for me to build you up into who I've called you to be, not who your mother called you to be, not who your sister called you to be, not who your church called you to be, not who your community called you to be, but I want to build you up into what I saw. And so you have to be willing to let God demolish what you have built. If it means that you can become who God has called you to be. I hear that song playing in my head now. I want to be where you are. At what point do you say, I am so desperate to be where you are, that even if you demolish everything I've built, if you've demolished my dream, if you demolish my idea of 
what my life should look like, but it means that I get to be with you, God, you can tear it down. God, you can tear down anything in me that doesn't look like what you're trying to build in me. I'm not in love with any job. I'm not in love with any career. I'm not in love with any dream more than I am in love with being where you are because I recognize there is provision when I am where you are. There is protection when I am where you are and there has to come this desperation down on the inside of us where we say to ourselves, Father, I want you to help me look at the foundation that has produced who I am. Our mind is the foundation of who we are. As a man thinketh, so is he. That is the foundation that we build our lives on. I can tell what you think about yourself based on the relationships you're in. I can tell what you think about yourself based on the thoughts that come out of your mouth, by the way you communicate with other people, by the way you handle other people's heart. It says to me how you communicate with yourself and how you handle your heart because as a man think it. That's why the internet is really such an interesting place because you get to see people's thoughts and you're thinking that they're attacking you. They're not attacking you attack is the way that they speak attack is the way that they communicate with themselves the thoughts that you receive are a reflection of the thoughts that are down on the inside of them as a man thinketh so is he and so when God gets ready to transform us he starts with our mind be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind already has a shape. Your mind already has a rhythm. And God says, if I'm going to renew you, you have to be willing to lay down your mind, lay down your way of doing things, lay down your way of functioning so that we can determine what's worth sticking. Because when God looks at you, God doesn't just look at what you want him to see. God doesn't even look at where you are. All God sees is what he created. I feel the presence of God on that. Somebody needs to know that when you look at you, you see all of the things you did wrong. You see all of the things that you could have done better. And you end up stuck because you can't see beyond what happened to you and what you did and who violated you and who hurt you and who you hurt and who you need to forgive. And so you don't move because you can't see past that. But what you need to know is that when God looks at you, he only sees what he saw. I'm going to prove it to you in Isaiah. It says, Isaiah 43, I think it is, verse 20. 25, they're going to put it on the screen for me. It says, I, even I, this is God speaking to the prophet. He says, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God says, when I look at you, I blot it out of my mind because I cannot allow for what I have seen when I formed you in your mother's womb to be diluted by the sins that you have made. God says, I can forgive you, and I can help you to grow, and I can help you to become better. And the reason why I can do that is because I only see you at your highest potential. I got to say that the way it's hitting in my spirit, because I want you to understand that the reason God has called you, the reason why God is using you, the reason why God positions you has nothing to do with what you have gone through. It has nothing to do with even what you see when you look in the mirror, and it has everything to do with what he saw when he formed you in your mother's womb. I hear God saying, I only see good when I look at you. I only see perfection when I look at you. I only see you at your highest potential when I look at you. God says, I only see what I created. And it breaks my heart when you have missteps. And it breaks my heart when you mess up. Not because I don't believe better, but because I know you're better than that. You're better than the way you're acting. You're better than the way you're thinking. He gets upset with depression. He gets upset with anxiety. He gets upset when you're hurt. Not because he feels like it devalues you, because he knows you're better than that. And so God says, I'm going to give you power to rise to what I see. I'm going to give you authority to rise to what I see. I'm going to give you vision so you will be hungry for what I see. There comes a point in your life when you have an encounter with God where you start to get curious about what it is that God sees. God, how could you keep using me? How could you keep favoring me? How could you keep positioning me? And God says, you're wondering how, but it's all I ever saw. I saw that when you were a little boy. I saw that when you were a little girl. I saw that when they walked away from you. I saw that when they turned their back on you. You wanted them and I wanted you because I knew what I placed down on the inside of you. And when you come to a place where you make up your mind that I am who God says I am, I can do what God says I can do. My past is behind me. My future is ahead of me. And I want to figure out what it is that he knew. God, what is it that you see when you look at me? 
And I set my mind on that. That's where I have to live. And it doesn't mean that I don't get off track. And it doesn't mean that I don't have moments when I slip up. But I have to know where I set my mind. So that when I get lost, I can remember where home is. So that when I get frustrated, I can remember where home is. There's a place that God carved out for me. And this place that he carved out for me, this world doesn't even understand it. But I've made a decision to be who that person is. And so we set our mind on things above, recognizing that when we do that, that God reveals to us what he placed down on the inside of us. When Paul is speaking to the church in Colossians in these letters, they're coming to a point where they are being established as a church. Now, this is important because when we think about being established as a church, especially when we're in Pentecost week, Sometimes our modern and Western way of thinking allows us to believe that being established as a church means that we need a building fund. This isn't what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about establishing the mindset of you being the hands and feet of God. Establishing a mindset that means that even if I'm not in a building, I recognize that I am a part of the church. I am a part of what God is doing in the earth. I am a part of a kingdom that that started in heaven and touches down to the earth. Its expansion expands down into the earth. And so Paul is trying to get these people ready to understand this new calling, this new identity that he has called them into. And I feel like this is so important for someone because you're stepping into this new dimension of who God has called you to be. You're stepping into this new authority. You're stepping into this new level of leadership where you have to be willing to set your mind. The days of you being indecisive and not knowing which way you should go and what you should believe and what you should think, I hear God saying that's coming to an end because in order for me to build you in this next season, you need to be established. And if you're going to be established, then you have to be willing to set your mind. And so Paul says, I'm calling you out from amongst the world that you know so that you can understand the new world that you are engaging in. Doesn't that sound just like where we are right now? God is calling us out of what we've always known. And now we have to be established in a new normal. When this first started, we were all trying to figure out what it was and we were Netflixing and chilling and snacking. But now that this has become our new way of living, there are some people who have decided I can't just keep floating by anymore, waiting to see what the headlines are going to say. I'm going to have to establish myself in the midst of this new world. But where do I begin? And Colossians is very clear when it says to us that the way for us to begin is to start with having a set mindset. I wanna ask you a question, if you're taking notes, I want you to ask yourself this question and I want you to review it after this message is over and to really ask yourself where you align. That question is, what is the foundational thought of your existence and can it live in the presence of God? What is the foundational thought of your existence? The foundational thought of my existence, if I had to put it simply and not have this long run-on sentence, if I had to put it simply, it would be, I want to be where God is. I want to be where God is. And, And we have to know what the foundational thought of our existence is because we may deduce it down to something that this world understands but that can't live in the presence of God. The foundational thought of your existence can't be, I want to get married and I want to build wealth. That's an overflow type of mindset. But the foundational thought of your existence, what is it that drives you? What is it that pushes you forward? What is that thought that, that challenges you in your greatest moments? What is that thought? I want to be where God is. And I want to be connected with people who share that same foundational thought. Because if I am connected with people who share that same foundational thought, then when I start slipping, they can pull me back to where I am supposed to be. I need to be in relationship, whether it's in my church or in my friendships or romantically, with people who share that same foundational thought. 
I love this church because I am convinced that one of the foundational thoughts of this movement is that we take territory for the kingdom, that we go into spaces where they say we shouldn't be and we show up and we put up a banner that says we're supposed to be here because God has called me to be here. I love me a gangster Christian. I love somebody who doesn't mind saying, I don't care what you thought about everyone who came before me. I don't care what you thought about what I should look like or what I should sound like. What I care about is taking territory. What I care about is healing broken hearts. What I care about is making sure the homeless are fed. What is the foundational thought? Foundational thought people get together and they start building things that they could have never built on their own, but because we think the same way and we have the same foundation, we start building things that can't be shaken. I want to prophesy for a moment that God is going to start bringing people into your life who share that same foundational thought for their existence so that you can begin building. I want to prophesy I don't know who you are, but you have been looking for partnership. And I hear God saying that your partnership is going to come when you stop looking at what someone has on the outside and start asking them questions like what is the foundational thought for your existence? I don't care where you work. I don't care how tall you are. I don't care what your degree says or how many zeros you have in the bank account. What I want to know is what is the foundational thought for your existence? Because you can be fine and unstable, but if you know who God is and you have a foundational thought for the kingdom and you have a foundational thought for what God is going to do, you may be in an apartment today, but I will ride with you in that apartment. I ride with you homeless. I ride with you no matter where we go because we got a foundational thought that cannot be shaken and we're not looking at what the world can see. We're looking at what God God wants to build. I talk to my husband all the time, and I say, if me, you, and the kids end up in a minivan, but we still have the foundational thought for why God brought us together, then we will tell hell no on the sidewalk, and we will tell hell no until the kingdom is established no matter where we go, because we share share the same thought, and you need to get with somebody who shares the same foundational thought. I want you running my organization because you share the same thought. I want you to be in Brazil relationship with me because we share the same thought. What is the foundational thought of your existence? And can it live in the presence of God? You got to make up your mind. Your mind doesn't just come together. You make your mind. You set your mind on things above. And then you get in line with other people who know how to build the way that you build. I feel something on that. I need someone who understands what I'm building. I need someone who understands what wakes me up in the morning. I need someone to understand that this is bigger than me, that this is bigger than what other people can see, that my my identity in God is resting on whether or not I say yes. My identity in God is resting on whether or not I create. I'm not doing it so that it can hit a list. I'm not doing it so that I can become famous. I'm doing it because God placed it down on the inside of me and I have no other choice. I have no other choice that's got to come out of me. I have no other choice. I got to produce and I need someone who is desperate to do what God has called them to do. You can be indecisive somewhere else. Right now I'm in a season where I need to be established and I need to be around someone else who is laying a foundation that cannot be shaken. I can't smoke my way out of this one. I can't sex my way out of this one. I can't drink my way out of this one. I need something that cannot be shaken because when the winds blow and the flood comes, I'm going to still be standing. Because I built my life on something that cannot be shaken. I got to build on what cannot be shaken. And that's why Paul sends this letter to the church of Colossians. Because he says, I'm investing my life in this. And if I'm going to invest my life in this, I got to build a church that cannot be shaken. And I got to show you how to build by how you think. And I got to show you how to think by where you set your mind. All different types of thoughts can come to you, but can those thoughts live in the place that you have set? So Paul says, I need to give them instructions on how to set their mind. And as I was reading this text, I just studied this one word 
You know me usually, I have several scriptures, but there was something about this one word, set, 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 and being established. It kept ringing in my mind. It kept showing up. No matter where I was, it says, set your mind on things above. What this says to me is this. First of all, Paul came to where that church of Colossians was. He came to them. God sent a word to them. But God does not bring you a word to keep you where you are. God didn't even send Jesus down to earth to keep us where we were. He sent Jesus down to the earth because Jesus was on a mission to ultimately reconnect us back to God. God meets you where you are, but it is for the intent of taking you to where he is. I want to be where you are. Thank you for coming to where I am, but now take me to where you are. What if that became my prayer? God, I thank you for coming to me where I was. Father, I thank you for meeting me in the middle of this pain. Thank you for meeting me in the middle of this anxiety. But Father, now that you have met me, God, allow your power to lift me from where you met me. Allow your power to break me up, Father, so that I can be removed, break up the ground for where, from where I've been planted so that I could be planted where I need to be. And I studied this word set. And it's funny because if you've ever studied these words in the Bible, it starts off English and then it's Greek or Hebrew, depending on which word you're looking at. And then they have all of these different references for the word. Our English Bible is a translation that started in the Greek. And so when we look at this text, we have to be willing to figure out what was the original intent of the author. So it says set. But that word in the Greek, when I looked it up and I'm going to break it down, I'm going to give you three of the words because it kept breaking it down until we got to the root. That first part of it says exercise. So when I Greeked it, that word set says exercise. Exercise your mind on things above. I love that. Because what that communicates to me is that it's not always easy to just set your mind. Sometimes setting your mind is an exercise. Sometimes setting your mind is us being able to say, I'm going to have to exert my mind to, to things above. I'm going to have to stretch my mind to things above. I know that you are saved and sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and this is not your testimony, so just take this part of the message and send it to somebody else who struggles with being petty like I do and tell them, sis, petty may be where you are, but petty is not where you are supposed to be, and if you don't start exercising your mind, you're going to stay stuck. You have to be willing to exert your mind. I wonder how that shows up when we start talking about things like forgiveness. Forgiveness is not necessarily natural. What does that mean when it starts talking about our tendency to have low self-esteem? I'm, I'm going to have to stretch my mind. It won't happen all, all, it won't happen overnight. I'm going to have to stretch my mind to get there. I'm going to have to exert my mind. And there may be some moments when I exert my mind and my mind can't take it anymore, but I wake up the next day and I stretch it again. I wake up the next day and I'd exert it again because I recognize that the only way that I can build the muscle necessary for my mind to be set on things above of if, is if I start stretching my mind. We have a podcast on called Woman Evolve, and there's a segment of the podcast called Rescue Eve, and we call it Rescue Eve because the goal is to get people to stretch their mind and to see things that maybe were vilifying in the news in a different direction, in a different perspective, because there's something about exerting your mind. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. When you exert your mind, you stretch your mind to do what Jesus would do and to think how Jesus would think and to show up the way that Jesus would show up. And it is an exercise. It doesn't come naturally to you. So don't penalize yourself for not being where you are supposed to be, but be willing to stretch yourself until you become it. But it didn't stop there because after it talked about us exercising our mind, and then says to check out another Greek word that would better translate that word that they translated into exercise, and that was rein in. So setting your mind is exercising your mind and then reining your mind in. I love that because it's like I said a little bit earlier, you're going to have moments when you start having all different types of thoughts coming your way. 
all different types of ways of thinking, especially on social media. Social media, I think, is one of the greatest um, distractions and greatest highways of thoughts that anyone can ever be exposed to because one minute we're grieving what happened with George Floyd, the next minute we're looking at somebody's cute baby, the next minute we're hungry, it's a highway of thoughts, and every now and then you have to rein your mind in. I feel like someone needs to know that there are moments when you allow too many thoughts to exist in your world and that it is your responsibility to rein your mind in. It is your responsibility to be aware and intentional enough to know when you need to unplug, when you need to get in the presence of God, rein your mind into things above. Sometimes you got to shut it all down and turn on worship music, shut it all down and turn on a message because my mind is swirling with all of these different scenarios and all of these different issues and what if and, and how come and what if I am this and what if I'm that. And I hear God saying, rein your mind in, rein it in. And be okay with being able to say that I need to rein my mind in. As I was studying for this message, one of the things that I learned that I literally didn't know is that science is beginning to show that our human brains are wired towards a negative bias. That means that we lean a little negative. It says that this is probably a part of the early human history that we had to pay attention to bad, dangerous, and negative threats in order to survive. And those who were more attuned with those dangers paid more attention to bad things around them, they were more likely to survive. And so now that mindset has been passed down from generation to generation. And that's why it's important that this text is to set your mind on things above. Because if you allow your mind to be set by the culture or the family or the community that you live in, then you may be setting your mind towards something that keeps you from becoming who God has called you to be. Or setting your mind on things that keep you from really showing up in your purpose and showing up in the kingdom the way that you are supposed to be. There is no shame in knowing that I need to rein in my mind. And I want to say this because I feel like as a church, as a, not just this church, but as the body of Christ, that we've had some moments and some theologies that made us believe that there was something wrong with therapy. But if you are going to rein in your mind, then I want to challenge you that you may need help reining in your mind. And there's nothing wrong with that. It may take some medication for you to rein in your mind, and there's nothing wrong with that because you have to come to a place where you are willing to say, I will do whatever it takes for my mind to be set on things above. And if my brain has a chemical imbalance that keeps me from setting my mind on things above, then I need to get that fixed so that I can become who God has called me to be. They say that God doesn't need medicine, but God created doctors and created medicine. And sometimes we do need medication in order for us to become. Know when it's time for you to rein your mind in and don't be afraid to ask for help. And then the last thing, so that word set, once again in the Greek, it broke down to exercise. And then it told me to reference another word that was rein in. And there was another word that it told me to reference and this is when it stopped. And it literally says, stop. To fence in or stop. That is the final word, to stop your mind on things above. Man, that was so powerful to me when I read it because it made me realize that your mind has to have a stopping point. My mind was racing when I first got this message and I felt like God was saying, you know, this is what I want you to preach about. I want you to preach about what it requires for us to really make our minds up. We get up in, our mor in the morning and we make up our bed. Some of us do. We make up our bed in the morning and it takes a little work and that's why some of us don't do it because we're getting back in it. Why would we make it up? Because of the work required to make up your bed, sometimes we don't do it. Imagine the work that goes into making up your mind. It does take work, but there is the stopping point. And this text shows us that when we stop our mind on things above, that the presence of God is what allows our mind to become his mind. Why is it that he would tell us, Paul, to set our mind on things above, unless at the end of the day, God was trying to give us his mind? Man, what an honor and privilege it is to have access to the mind of God. God says, when you set your mind on things above, when you make up your mind, 
that my mind is going to be set on what's above, that I don't just leave you there, that I get to give you an exchange. So I got to get my mind to God. I got to get my heart to God. I got to get myself to God. I've allowed my mind to be with depression. I've allowed my mind to be with my insecurities. I've allowed my mind to be with my fears for long enough. Now I have to set my mind on things above. I have to be who God has called me to be because there is a gift waiting for me there. All throughout the Bible, it talks about how God wants to give us a divine exchange, how he has mysteries stored up for those who search him out, who seek him, who look for him. So I got to set my mind on things above so I can receive his mind. My mind stops in the presence. Because when my mind stops in the presence, his mind is what I receive in it instead. Have you ever been worshiping? And in that moment you were worshiping, in that moment you were listening to this message, and you started thinking to yourself, man, it's so funny, when I came into this, I was so heavy, but now I'm coming out of it and I feel like I have enough strength, I have enough vision, I have enough faith that I'm gonna be okay, that the creativity is gonna come. That's not just because we had this trance, it's, be it's because you came into the presence of God, and when you came into the presence of God, he gave you his mind instead. I remember in Isaiah, I actually gave them this text and the prophet Isaiah is talking about when the King Isaiah died. It says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. Two, he covered his face. And the two he covered his feet so you wasn't looking. The seraphim, they weren't looking and they weren't moving. But the other two, they were using to fly. So in this instance, they got angels in the presence of the Lord and the angels aren't looking and the angels' feet, they aren't moving. The only thing they're doing is doing enough to stay up in the presence of God. That's what happens when we're in the presence. He elevates us enough that our eyes don't matter, our path doesn't matter, but in this moment, all that matters is that we stay up. And then it says that these two seraphims were just crying to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy. These seraphims for a moment, they were wrapped up in what, when they saw the earth, they didn't see the racism. When they saw the earth, they didn't see the pain. When they saw the earth, they didn't see a pandemic. When they saw the earth, they didn't see division. All they saw was that the earth was full of God's glory. It doesn't mean that that glory had been manifested. It just meant that the earth was so full of potential for God's glory. So much potential that when they saw it, all they could do is stay in the presence of God and say holy 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 and I hear God saying that I'm looking for some people who don't mind looking at my presence and seeing the earth the way that I see it and being the ones who are willing to establish the glory that this earth is meant to carry this earth is meant to carry glory the same things those seraphims were saying in that moment they're saying right now I bet you if we could look into the windows of heaven that we would see angels looking down on the earth saying holy 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 the Lord of hosts the earth is full of God's glory the earth is full of God's glory and you are God's glory you are God's plan you are God's strategy you are God's idea and you got to make up your mind that I am God's strategy in the earth and so I have to show up with my mind stayed on Jesus so that I can run this race so I can bridge this gap so that I can eradicate hate this is my job this is my role and I do it, not because I believe in what I see on this earth, but I believe it because my mind is set on things above. And so when I look at this earth, I look at it the same way the seraphims did. And I say, God, there's so much room for your glory here. Father, there's so much room for transformation. There's so much room for change. 
you're watching this message, I want you to type, I'm God's strategy, I'm God's strategy, I'm God's strategy, I'm God's strategy. I want you to start prophesying that over where you are right now. God, unleash your strategy over where I am right now. Father, I'm ready to set my mind on things above. I want to pray with you. I want to pray that in this time that we had together, that God had begun to really reveal to you that there's room for you to exercise your mind on things above. Maybe you've already found that place, but now it's time for you to rein your mind in. And I want, I want to pray specifically that God would give you strategy on what reining your mind in looks like for you. Maybe that means having boundaries with people. Maybe that means getting help. Maybe that means finally going to see that therapist and not just thinking it's a good idea. But what I want to pray most of all is that the racing your mind, I feel this for somebody, your mind has been racing nonstop. It seems like it never ends. That nonstop mind racing doesn't exist in the presence of God. And so our goal, our job, our responsibility is to make room so that we can be where God is. That's you. I just want you to type, that's me. That's me. That's me. I want you to own where you are. Because when you own where you are, you have the ability to change where you're headed. Sometimes we don't want to own where we are. I don't want to own the fact that I'm struggling. I don't want to own the fact that my pride has got me out here, that my ego's got me out here, that my pain has made me start doing some things that, un that are unlike me. But I need you to own where you are. You don't have to tell us where you are, but I want you to own that I got a little off track. Because now, we can, I, now that we have identified the crack and your foundation. We can ask God to tear down anything that you've built on that crack so that he can repair it and build it again. I wanna pray with you. Father God, man, in your presence, in your presence there is joy, in your presence there is healing, in your presence there is love, in your presence there is overflow. Spirit of the living God, what we want now more than ever is to set our mind on things above. We live in an earth that pulls us down. It makes us negative sometimes. It makes us hurt sometimes. It makes us wonder and depressed and anxious sometimes. But Father, when we set our minds on things above, you will give us strategy on how to navigate this earth. And so Father, we give you our mind and we ask for you to make it up. We ask for you to fix it, to transform it, to change it, Father. And we ask that you would bring us into alignment with people who are on the same path, with people who possess that same passion to have a foundational thought that is built or that is based in who you are and what you're doing in the earth. Father, I pray for everyone viewing right now. I wanna speak to that anxiety. I wanna speak to that depression. I wanna speak to that fear. And I wanna speak Jesus over it. I speak Jesus, I feel God on that. I speak Jesus over your anxiety. I speak Jesus over your depression. I speak Jesus over your pride. I speak Jesus over your brokenness. I speak Jesus over your abandonment issues. I speak Jesus over those rejection issues. I speak Jesus, 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 Jesus. He knows how to fill in the cracks. Jesus, 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 he knows how to restore you. Jesus, 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 he knows how to build you up again. I plead the blood of Jesus over you right now in the name of Jesus. I speak Jesus over your health. I speak Jesus over your dreams. I speak Jesus over your purpose. I speak the kingdom of heaven has come. And because the kingdom of heaven has come, we push darkness away. Father, we ask that you would touch us in the places we need it the most. And that you would open us up to receive the transformation that is the reason why you met with us in the first place. Father, please don't leave us the same. Father, please don't allow us to come into this place the same way that we came in. But Father, transform us that when the message is over and we shut down our phones and close our laptops, that this will stick with us. And when insecurity and, and low self-esteem and anxiety and, and doubt begin to creep in, Father, I ask that you would give us the remembrance of what this message did for us, that you would remind us that we have the ability and the power to set our mind on things above. Father, we receive this word. We ask that you would allow it to take root, 
and produce fruit in our lives. Father, forgive us. Forgive us, Father, for not living up to who we know we could be. Forgive us for being indecisive in moments when we should have shown up as our true, authentic, divine selves. We repent, Father. We change our minds so that you can change our actions. And we ask that you would allow us to walk in covenant with you afresh. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, you know I have to have a little homework for you. So if you've been touched by this message and you said, this is my word, I want you to go to Colossians 2, and I want you to start in verse 12. I mean, you know, my husband would say, read the whole Bible, but Colossians 3, verse 12 through 17, and it just talks about the character of the new man, and it's going to help us to ex understand what we're exercising our mind towards. There's some big folks, some big adult folks stuff in there talking about kindness and humility and meekness and long-suffering, things that are unnatural to us, but supernatural in God. So that's your homework. I want you to start dissecting. Don't overwhelm yourself, but pick up just one or two things that you want to focus on in this season where you say, I want to stretch my mind to be more like above in this area. And then we'll tackle another area and we'll do it over and over again until God has said, Good job. Well done, my good and faithful servant. We love you. Thank you for activating with us. We cannot wait to see you on Saturday and then on Sunday.